Hey guys, so you're about to watch through the Instagram live presentation that myself and Dr. Mike Israel did whilst they were here in Australia touring around as a part of Renaissance periodization. We discuss a myriad of topics through on volume landmarks through to how to grow muscle. So make sure you guys enjoy this, check it out and let us know what you think about it. Alrighty, so how are you going Flex Success viewers? Welcome. Today I am here joined with Mike, Big Mike from RP, Renaissance Periodization. Mike's here in Australia currently for a couple of tours actually and we're lucky enough to have him here in Brisbane uh, who he and the rest of the team is being hosted by Ryan Short at Inogra Fitness. And so Mike has agreed to do some Q&A, a really uh, close, personal, intimate uh, Q&A with us here at the Australians. <laughs> Uh, we'll see what we can get out of him, hopefully some cool nutrition and training topics um, and then maybe some personal stuff as well. I'll jump on and check up. If you've got any questions, post them in the comments. We'll see what's going on as we go through. But I've also cultivated a whole bunch of questions from people earlier. Mike is only just glancing at them now, so he hasn't had a chance to see them or prepare anything for him. So hopefully we'll get some raw, unedited responses from him in uh, like res actual his actual thoughts on these topics at hand raw responses on a couch on a backyard Easy. I've done this before <laughs> <laughs> alrighty so um, firstly actually before ever we jump into these do you want to explain what it is you do a little bit of your background for those that aren't familiar with you we Sh don't have sure. a massive following here in Australia of you we have a good following but not compared to the European and the US audience that sure, you guys sure. have. Yeah. So I think it would be really helpful for these guys to get to know who you are, what you're about and cool. your story. Cool. Uh, well first of all thanks for having me on. Anytime. It's an honor. And uh, so I'm a doctor, Mike Isretel. Um I have a PhD in sport physiology which means that the thing I know best is how to take good athletes and make them better. Um, I like I know a little bit about injury but not a ton. Um, People always think that's what, you know, the education's in. But uh, I was a professor for a while, and then the company I started with, my uh, friend Nick, uh, Renaissance Periodization, we basically supply training, coaching, and knowledge and things like that. Started to grow and grow and grow, and eventually I couldn't be a professor anymore because the company got so big and I had to do that. Uh, and then uh, we uh, started getting into digital product stuff, templates, mm -hmm. and now we have a full-blown diet app mm -hmm. that I helped to engineer. And it's uh, it's really big and it's really cool, yeah, so that's so really exciting. Yep. Um, so and it uses AI. It does, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's I helped to uh, design that system, that's which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, I basically sit at home and write algorithms most of my <laughs> life, uh, which I think is fun, but yep. most people don't. <laughs> and then uh, yeah, I've, wrote, I've written a bunch of books and stuff. And I used to coach. Um, I still coach sort of for fun, just my friends every now and again. But um, what I really is my passion is. A deep theoretical understanding of diet and uh, lately especially hypertrophy training yep. so and, and then in my spare time so to speak I uh, train uh, for bodybuilding just uh, getting jacked and lean um, and you're easy to look really lean as well you yeah like, oh thanks so much yeah, yeah. this yeah. is me a little messed up yeah I got pretty lean and uh, learned a lot during the fat loss phase so it was really cool and um, yeah I also do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu I'm a purple belt um, competitive so yeah, yeah it's uh, you know, I guess I kind of like sort of live the lifestyle, you could say. And uh, uh, the number one reason I do all this stuff is because it's super fun. But uh, yeah, I guess I'm passionate about it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who would who would have guessed? You know, yeah. PhD. I competitively, guess. Right. A little bit of passion. Yeah, I hate all this stuff. Yeah. Just, but just Grind do it your way. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, fair enough. All right, cool. Um, before we jump into these, though, I wanted to ask: Have you got any plans of competing, or did you just do that last cut for your own? sake to see yeah so like do. I did the cut mostly for myself I yep. was gonna compete but I got really sick instead so yep. I really sucked yeah right. um, and then you know um, I was gonna just compete again mm -hmm. after but I look at a really busy travel schedule all over. somebody's done <laughs> <laughs> so um, as soon as I uh, you know was gonna sort of regroup and compete I had to travel a bunch and then once you travel it's really like you know, you're never gonna have your best showing yeah. So, so to speak. Yeah, so fun. now I'm uh, I've sort of retuned with my coaches Jared Feather and, and Broderick Chavez, and we sort of retooled and we're. Uh, it's the first time I'm actually announcing this in public. Yeah, announcing is that minor details of my life are important, but uh, I'm going to try to mass up to something sort of ridiculous. Uh, so I'm so going to try to get really big. Yeah. Uh, not scale weight big, but just really gnarly and lean and jam for yeah. a reason. So. Uh, we'll see how that goes, and then when I'm satisfied with how large I've gotten, uh, within the next one or two years, 
years. We'll uh, look, we'll probably be competing in a show and sort of trying to perfect the show competition situation. But for now, I'm uh, massing up, and then I'll be taking a little bit of a break, uh, sort of active rest in a couple of weeks, uh, regrouping after that, mini cut, and then back into incrementally more serious massing. Well, I've definitely got heaps more questions about that, but Sounds great. we've got a whole bunch of questions asked by people earlier on. So I wanted to just start reading through these and get your idea on them. I think I've tried to reword them from some just because they're little short little Instagram so questions. Ones. worded. So <laughs> <laughs> they get asked by very stupid people. So. Yes, no. Um, so I've reworded some just so that it makes a little bit more sense, or I think I got the gist of what they were trying to ask there. Sure. Um, so the first one is actually in response to the last time that you guys were here. So uh, Coach Lizzie, one of the other female coaches of the company that I work for, uh, she asked, the last time that you guys were here, they mentioned keeping the food uh, clean food only. You were talking about trying to reduce hyperpalatable foods, uh, and this included non-processed foods, so trying to reduce that down in cut, cutting phases. Um, so uh, Lizzie gathers that this is due to reduced palatability, like we are just talking about. So because of the black and white restrictions that uh, dieters can or can't eat at certain stages that, of their diet, do you guys find it's commonplace for clients to overconsume on these hyperpalatable foods and kind of lead, it, uh, lead into a binge restrict cycles like that, or do you find that there's a little bit more flexibility and we just maybe miss the point? Yeah. Well, so uh, for, the first thing to say is I think this is pretty evident from the researchers is some people just do really well with black and white rules, mm -hmm. and some people do well with shades of gray, mm -hmm. um, and there really is a kind of bipolarity in the response there where. Some people just, do, you know, if you give them a little bit of hyperpalatable mm -hmm. foods, they just end up like, they wake up with like dead clowns and a thing of Cheetos, and they're like, I don't know how I got here, right? Yeah. Uh, which the dead clowns are good because clowns are evil, mm -hmm. so. Right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, maybe you didn't want to be the one to kill them, you just right. kind of want to drive by as they're getting killed. So, <laughs> yeah, it's good. Somebody's doing something for the community. Um, but, uh, and then other people, uh, they, you know, have like one or two, uh, what do you guys call them? Chips or crisps here? Potato chips? Chips. Chips. Yeah. Um, you have one or two chips and you're good. Uh, and if you don't have one or two chips, you feel sort of incrementally more restricted and you're burdened, mm -hmm. and then you, you burn out of the diet because of that. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to ascertain with your clients if you're working with them in this capacity is to try to understand which side of the spectrum they fall on. And there's, all, there's actually sort of shades of gray in between the two spectra, but there's a little bit of a distinct bipolarity there. There's definitely some humps. Um, so that being said, if you have someone wherever they are on that side, uh, it pays during periods of really restrictive dieting or during periods of coming out of really restrictive dieting to reduce hyperpalatable foods because they do tend to increase the chances, especially if you're a person who does the black and white thing, of uh, the binge purge cycles. And even if it's not going to result in a binge purge cycle, it's just like you look at a meal with hyperpalatable foods, and Eric Helms actually on his page had a great visual, uh, visual representation of this. Like if you eat mostly unprocessed sort of healthy foods, mm -hmm. you can get this big plate of stuff. When you're already restricted in how much food you're having, it's great to feel full and so on and so forth. But if you just fill it with like pieces of cheese and potato chips, it can be the same macros, but it's this tiny little thing, you're done eating it. And the, the real trick here with hyperpalatable foods is that you get this reflex uh, desire, especially in a hyper maybe particularly in a hypocaloric diet, where it's that taste of the good life just leaves you wanting more. The most, is this okay for me to get like more adult themed down here? Is oh, it no okay? Yeah. It is kind of like the, the analogy here is like, you know, if you're like celibate, do you go to a strip club and just watch the strippers for a bit? Like, mm -hmm. that's not a good idea. Or like you hook up with someone and you just kind of let them touch on you for a bit, you make out and you're like, all right, good enough. That like, that's like a couple of potato chips for me and I'll just be on my way. Maybe if you're going to be celibate, like, you know, people do, like, the celibacy challenges with mm -hmm. dumbass fuck shit as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. but <laughs> they only live once. <laughs> right. But uh, people do that, you know, for whatever, like, psychological health. I'm pretty sure it's not a good idea to, like, watch porn during that time or sort of halfway hook up with people because mm -hmm. it's just, just going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with food is, like, if you don't have, and here's the trick, if you don't have the requisite calories to just get as full as you want, mm -hmm. don't fill those calories with foods that make you want to eat more. Mm -hmm. Like, you eat two apples on a slice of chicken, and people are like, whoa, you, you gonna fucking just eat everything now? You're like, no, I'm pretty sure I'm done. <laughs> but if you eat, like, half a slice of pizza, same calories, but you're wanting more and more. So on, like, a mass phase, when you're on a maintenance phase, when your relationship with food is very healthy uh, and very balanced, then you're not, like, your hormones aren't thrown off and your hunger signaling isn't crazy, then, yeah, you have half a pizza. Because this is definitely one of those things, and, and actually, interestingly enough, 
uh, Melissa Davis, one of our peak coaches, Dr. Melissa Davis, she's going to be talking about this a lot during our Australia tour and something she talks about a lot is fat loss dieting is not a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It is a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. During that temporary thing, you might have those hyperpalatability restrictions. When you go ease back into maintenance and when your relationship with food becomes healthy again because your hormones normalize, your body fat normalizes, then it's time to just, people say, hey, you want pizza? You say, yeah. Uh, how many slices here? I don't know. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Right? But that's not always the time. And people get really burned coming out of show prep or coming out of a real hard fat loss diet where you're basically primed for food to taste a fucking unbelievable. And then you have half a pizza, or half a pizza, <laughs> you have half a slice, and you end up eating half a pizza because yeah. of that hyperpalatability of Yeah. Well, it's definitely evident when you see people do uh, large fat loss phases or comp prep. The, the stupid foods that they put together that they think taste amazing. Yes. Which is why I, for one, will never listen to anyone who's in comp prep and recommend a food to me. Oh my God, terrible. You, you, yeah. you guys are horrible. Or just the weird combinations. They're like, are you pregnant or something? Yeah. Like pickles and ice cream? But I yeah, can't even deal. Yeah. Totally, and then, you know, if that shit tastes good, as soon as you get real pizza or sushi, yeah, you're just gonna fall off the face that. of the earth. Yep. Yeah, no, no, definitely, I understand that. Cool, alrighty, uh, so Zane Clarkson, uh, he had a couple questions. So the first one was, how does bone structure affect one's ability to efficiently load a particular muscle? So, for example, someone with narrow shoulders who struggles to feel any stretch or loading on their pecs. Yeah, it's a thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's the only determinative factor. Some people with narrow shoulders can feel their pecs just fine. But what ends up happening, I think, uh, sometimes you're built a certain way that other limbs and other muscles just have a much higher amplitude of motion. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, if you're of a certain build, uh, your pecs might not even be super deeply stretched in a bench press with a normal grip, but your triceps are already like maximally stretched. And because stretching uh, by itself is a, a sort of causative of hypertrophy and it's actually very uh, disruptive, mm -hmm. then you might have a limiting factor of triceps on your bench press and get a lot of tricep work out of your bench, whereas your pecs kind of left behind. Mm -hmm. um, what I will say is that because of the, the relationship of joint structure, um, to which muscles you feel and which you don't or which are limiting factors on lifts is complicated because you have to, there's a joint structure of not just your sort of like uh, intracromial width, but then there's also like the limb length, the uh, various parts of your other limbs. There's also factors of your muscle design. And some people's pecs are just designed in a certain way that they just take over everything and some people's pecs are not. Where your pec inserts on the bone, where it inserts here on the sternum, so on and so forth. The actual structure of your joint and how flexible each joint is uh, like some people have very flexible shoulder joints, uh, some people don't, so they might not be able to do everything. So you guys have a very multifactorial problem. So just looking at one variable and saying it's because I have narrow shoulders, the answer is maybe, maybe you do. Maybe it's because of 50 other reasons. This is where, and this is actually, it was shameless plugs all day here, in a variety of the seminars here that we're doing in Australia, specifically at the UEBC, which we're gonna be at the end of this in Melbourne, uh, we're talking about something called the stimulus to uh, fatigue ratio. And it's a way of analysis, it's a rather informal analysis, but it works to see how effective an exercise is for you. Mm -hmm. So for example, like, does it give you a pump? Mm -hmm. Do you perceive tension in the target muscles well? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, someone's like, do this curl, you'll feel your bicep, and you're like, nope, <laughs> just feel it right here, and they're like, okay, well, I guess that's not the exercise for yep. you or your technique's off. Um, does it give you delayed onset muscle soreness if you do lots of it? Yep. Right, DOMS is not a proxy for growth, but it sure as hell is a proxy for are you targeting what you think you're targeting? Yeah. Imagine someone's like, imagine this crazy quad exercise, you do 10 sets of it and your glutes get sore and your quads don't feel a thing. Are you really sure it's a quad exercise? Like, I'm willing to bet it's not, <laughs> right? So you get those things on the plus side and the minus side, uh, pain that is not good in your joints. Uh, total central systemic fatigue that you get from an exercise. Imagine someone's like, hey man, this exercise is gonna fuck up your lats. You do like 10 sets of it, your lats don't get sore at all, but you're like dead the next day and you can't extend your back. Like maybe that's not the best exercise for you, right? So you basically do, and, and I'll get into more of this in the presentations, you take like an index of like three or four measures on the stimulus side, three or four measures that you could just do yourself every workout on the fatigue side. And then you sort of divide like, it's like a one through three scale on each one, like how pumped did I get? How much lactate accumulation did I get? How sore did I get after? It's like one to three. And then the fatigue side is one to three, you just divide the top by the bottom and it gives you a ratio of stimulus to fatigue. How effective is the exercise, how much muscle growth is it probably stimulating, versus how much is it costing you fatigue-wise? Because remember, fatigue's like not a big deal if you're smaller and not super strong, you have all the uh, shit in the world, your, your MRV systemic is like enormous, you'll just never hit it. Yeah. But also, it's per unit of fatigue. You could have just done a better exercise and gotten more stimulus, you know what I mean? So you figure all that out and then from there, 
you can do that for every single exercise you do and just end up with the best SFR exercises in your own toolbox. And people say, like, for the love of God, like, God, this is Instagram. Instagram, fucking pay attention. I get these questions on Instagram. I'm sure you see this on my, on my feed. Dr. Mike, what's the best quad exercise? There's no such fucking thing. <laughs> no, there's, like, a, my favorite top five. Yeah. And there's, like, a biomechanically probably best top ten. And then there's, like, a what most jacked lifters consider mm-hmm. the best top ten. There's some agreement. Mm-hmm. But you can't lens in any further for yourself. You can for yourself, but not from reading my Instagram. It's for trying the top five that we all sort of recommend. I'll just list them now. Hack squats, leg presses, uh, high bar squats, and maybe a couple other movements. Probably the best things for quads, for Mm -hmm. example. Which one of those, how they rank for you, you have to rank on your own stimulus to fatigue ratio. Like some people do hack squats and they're like, my hips hurt. Like how are your quads? They're like, meh. Some people do hack squats, they're like, oh my god, my quads are going to blow up. I do like two sets, I get pumped, I get sore, I get crazy, my knees don't feel a thing. I can do these forever and just load them like crazy. It's probably a good exercise. So, for the, to answer, to finally come around to the answer to this question, I assume you're interested in the long answer. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay, definitely. sweet. Of course. It's <laughs> just like one word answer, you're like, this guy sucks. <laughs> uh, like, let's just take my phone and leave. <laughs> um, so, to answer the question of like, what do you do if you don't feel your pecs, um, try three or four different chest exercises, figure out which one you get the most stimulus out of, the least fatigue out of, those top three, top four are going to be the ones you rotate in and out all the time. Like I have like top five exercises for every single muscle group that I know about. And every again, every now and again, I'll try something new or my training partners will try an exercise and be like, oh, that looks cool to try a different technique. I'll try it. And most of the time it's just, ah, that kind of sucked. Mm-hmm. But some of the time it'd be like, wow, this either has a high stimulus to fatigue ratio right away or it's got like serious potential. And you're like, you're using a new leg press machine and you're like, I think I put my feet in the wrong place, but I know that like it's a sweet machine and it felt pretty good. Like if I next session experiment with my feet in a different place I have a feeling it's going to go really well so exercises like that new ones you could thread into your top five and and eventually you have this arsenal this toolbox of moves that's really good for you and again it might not be amazing for other people so sometimes people say like, oh you know like like, what's probably one of the most ridiculous questions I ever get? It was not ridiculous. I'm not upset about it or anything. Um, it's not ridiculous at face value. It's just if you've been training long enough, it, you know it's ridiculous. It's like, hey, like, uh, like, so like, I'll post a video of me doing like those stupid Smith machine feet forward squats that I do, and someone will say like this or high bar squat, and I'm like, Ugh, it's not either or. First of all, you can do one for six months and do another for six months. And then the other answer is like, try both of them for a while, multiple rotations and muscle cycles, see which one you like best. Because some people, like the Smith machine, will just, it doesn't matter where they put their feet, they don't fucking feel weird, it'll tweak their back, they can't get a good setup, fucking don't use it. Mm-hmm. And then some people, high bar squats feel all wrong, but that Smith machine squat thing feels amazing. So it's all about individualizing the, extra, individualizing the exercise. And that individualization, of course, doesn't mean that you do fuck all crazy dumb shit and be like, oh, for me, yeah. partial curls work best. It's like, no, they don't. You're just a lazy asshole. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> good exercises with good technique, and then which ones you use to what degree, you need to put that top rotation in there and see what works best for you. Yeah, yeah for sure. I really like that. I'm just going to double check this to make sure. Sure. That. People aren't saying, oh, we can't hear you the whole time. That would be fucking hilarious. <laughs> uh, mic's too wide to fit in any vertical video. Uh, cool. yep. Sweet. There are a fair few. Cool. Awesome. Sweet. We'll just keep going. Alrighty, so Zane, second question. I actually thought it, it, this one was a, a, a good one because I don't think the answer would be too long. So I was fair enough to throw it in there. Um, what would your thoughts be on blood flow restriction training being implemented with more intense loads, say towards the 70 plus percent of one RM? Um, where the tourniquet is used, the rest periods are kept pretty short, three minutes. Um, do you think that will impact the time to regenerate ATP fast enough in your type 2 fibers? Yeah, I've tried that. There's not a sufficiently long time to get the blood flow restriction uh, effect to really do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like you, the set is too short mm-hmm. as far as time, and then you're like, ah, oh, I kind of just felt like I could have done a good heavy set, yeah. I shot myself in the foot by putting this blood flow cuff and got like three less reps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, so I think higher reps, uh, lighter weight allows you, first of all, to focus on the mind-muscle connection a little bit more, mm-hmm. and second of all, just have the, I hate to say that there's time under tension mm-hmm. long enough to sequester a shitload of metabolites, which mm-hmm. is all fun point mm-hmm. of the training. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I think in some exercises, that's okay, mm-hmm. but in others, you'll find that you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot with heavy loading mm-hmm. um, and not allowing enough time to really sequester metabolites. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that occlusion training or blood flow restriction training is working 
when as you're doing it, the pump becomes unmanageable and the lactic acid accumulation becomes the most painful fucking thing you've ever felt in your, in your entire mm-hmm. life. But if you do it with such low reps that that never really happens, which I've done, a lot of these answers, like I've done the mm-hmm. dumb shit before. Yeah. Like I've done like sets of five and six yep. with blood flow restriction and I'm just like, ah. I guess nothing's happening. Yeah. But like sets of 20 and you're like, get me out of here. And that's exactly what you want to feel with BFI. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think if you were doing it with BFI, you would, uh, sorry, not doing it with BFI. If you're doing 70 plus percent 1RM, um, it would make sense more to just leave it as strength training as opposed to trying exactly. to include something like that. Exactly. Um, yeah, cool. Awesome. Sweet. All righty. So next up, uh, what is your preferred bulk to cut ratio for alternate growth and body composition? I think time is the bulk to cut ratio in time yeah so like uh if you're just trying to get jacked yeah body composition yeah yeah yeah. so the so the first answer is so there's one main answer which is probably like two to one Mm -hmm. uh, just rough Mm -hmm. even three to one because bulking just takes longer than cutting Mm -hmm. um and and mini cutting is an effective way to lose lots of body fat without risking your muscle there's no such thing as mini bulking (laughs) just like you had kfc a few too many times yeah (laughs) <laughs> um, that's the first answer. The second answer is that the first answer can be modified heavily based on where you're starting from. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're like 25% body fat, you don't three to one it because <laughs> you'll just stay somewhere between 23 and 27 and you'll just be a fat fuck forever. Yeah. <laughs> People will be like, you're like, oh yeah, I bodybuild. And they're like, ah, you don't want to like, that. that's not what you want. Take your top like off. they, oh really? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I don't have to tell people I bodybuild nowadays, and they're like, you bodybuild. And I usually just lie and say, I don't actually train with weights. I did that today on the airplane, on the way over to Australia. I'm like, oh, you must lift a lot. And I was like, I've actually never lifted. They get this confused look. I'm just I don't go enough. Yeah, I should. people say I should go to the gym. Yeah. I might have a good response. I'm really good. Wouldn't it be sweet if you had, like, an unbelievable genetics for initial condition, mm. but none for adaptability? <laughs> like, you're in their days, and you're like, nothing's happening. They're like, wow, that, I guess that's kind of, you just, you the limit. sweet, just yeah. do you, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, I think that if you're in a place where you're in the 10 to 15% range, blah, 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 where are you guys going? The servo. Oh, fuck, how far away is it? It's like half a mile. Aren't you in the middle of a live feed? Yeah, it's, it's good as a shit. It's live. It's, you know, this is like, whatever, this is like real shit. Hey, can you guys fucking get me a few things or... Yeah. Um, protein bars and like protein shakes or whatever, just whatever, HPLC, and then uh, like just like one or two cans of some kind of like diet energy drink. Yeah. Okay. Caffeine shit. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Don't get eaten by quakas or whatever. Do you guys have quakas here? I don't think so. I'm just kidding. It's like a Western <laughs> Australia thing. Are we still good? Is it working? Yeah, yeah, no, we're still going good. All right, awesome. So, so yeah, so but that's the answer, like, so for example, if you're like 20% body fat or whatever, maybe you can still maybe you can go on a three to one cut to bulk ratio mm-hmm. right and there's there's maintenance phases in there there should be in there too right but then so you basically people say like oh like here's a common question people are like well i'm like 20 percent fat but i want to be like 10 to 15 mm-hmm. should i just cut until i get to 10 which takes infinity and then start a new i'm like no you should cut cut bulk bulk cut, mm-hmm. cut bulk bulk but eventually this kind of zigzag leads you down yeah. so the ratio should be based on where you are but once you're in that for meals 10 to 15 for females 17 to 25 then a three to one is probably sensible and then when you want to compete um then it turns into a whatever cut gets you to compete but and that's actually a really interesting distinction to draw i'm actually super happy we're doing this because i get to expound i'm super like i hate because there's only so much i can type with my fucking retarded looking thumbs so um on instagram i give like one word answers (laughs) which i really hate myself for because there's so much nuance right um one of the pieces of nuance here is that uh people see so much traditional length fat loss dieting mm-hmm. in people's experiences and their athlete favorites that they sort of think like part of the bulking and cutting process is doing super long cuts mm-hmm. and it's not mm-hmm. like when you're interested in putting on serious muscle mass for the long term most of what you do is bulking a little bit of maintaining and not a whole lot of cutting like in a real world example you m- might do like a 20 week bulk mm-hmm. a four week maintenance and an eight week cut mm-hmm. And then you repeat. Mm-hmm. But like, and people think, well, gee, like, shouldn't the cut be as long as the bulk? Like, you can cut like a half percent to one percent of your body weight per week. You're gonna bulk at 0.25 to 0.5 percent of your body weight. It's like half the yeah. speed yeah. maximum, right? Yeah. So I think people get caught That's up. That's a good end too. Like when you're really struggling. Totally, totally. And then people get into all sorts of like they get uh, tempted to do all sorts of dumb shit. Like, 
the end of your cut is coming up, mm-hmm. and you know you're lean enough to have a gnarly, productive as fuck ball. You're your strongest ever. You have lost no strength, no momentum, even on your cut. And people get this fucking starry-eyed look, and they're like, I should just keep cutting to get mm-hmm. super lean. Mm-hmm. You dumb asshole. We're not trying to get lean right now. We're trying to get big. Yeah. Um, you know, I've made many, many mistakes in my uh, hypertrophy career so far. One of the mistakes I have not made was trying to pursue excessive leanness, uh, which hurt my muscularity. But I have seen lots of people do that. And, and they sort of look at you, they're like, you know, they like I weigh, what, like 235 now or whatever. People who weigh 170 sometimes like ask me. They're like, "Oh, but like, how do you get this big?" I'm like, "Getting uncomfortably big on purpose, mm-hmm. and then getting bigger than that, and then eating, and then getting bigger." And they're like, "But I don't want to like get rip like my grid, my ripped six pack." I'm like, "Sweet, you'll never be big. Yeah. Good job." Yeah, see you later. Yeah, they yeah. should have like a collage of off-season bodybuilders <laughs> to motivate. Right. You right. ever see those Dorian Yates pictures? Oh yeah, hell yeah. Like any of them. Even uh, one of my favorite ones is. Like one of Ronnie's ones where he's like super bulked and stuff, like he's heavy, heavy, and he looks so thick. And I was like, oh, he's like, I have no idea how he wiped his own ass or anything. No. Ronnie, like off season two thousand three, where he was like three thirty, he was just like, he was like, oh, was that one hundred fifty kilos? Yeah, and just like, <laughs> okay, here we go. Alrighty, um, all right, cool. So, um, Ali Walker, one of our clients over at Flex Success, asked the effects on aging or muscle hypertrophy uh, for those who are over forty. Female or male? Female. Yeah. Specifically, but maybe Sweet. both. Maybe yeah, both. females seem to... Uh, so the, the biggest... So, so the first thing is negative. The answer is negative. Yeah, it's never okay. um, Don't however, get over it. Right? Don't get old. <laughs> Try to prevent that from happening. Yeah. You're just using crazy high-dose growth hormone until you just die. <laughs> die young, right? Die young, yeah. Um, so my first answer is die young. <laughs> if you want to know how to do that, go watch the Elton John movie. And <laughs> it's just basically a how-to guy. Yep. Um, so first the answer is you know the effects are not great but the second answer is like sort of depending on when you start and how serious you were when you were younger you can get amazing new gains not just maintenance not just slowing the losses for well into your 40s and 50s because I, I always have to bifurcate my answers to this question because I sort of assume that the people asking are like have been hardcore training maximum effort at least and close to optimality since they were like 15 or 20 mm-hmm. and now they're like 42 and they're like is there any more gains and the answer is like no probably not <laughs> right but not everyone is like 3d mj godfather mm-hmm. right like a lot of people asking this question you know they're let's say 51 years old and they first got into actual weight training when they were 47 mm-hmm. and they're like well now that i'm in my 50s what happens do i just lose it? you will gain into your 60s if yeah. you start that oh, yeah. late um, is it going to be the kind of gains like cocksuckers in their 20s are getting around you? No. Mm-hmm. But they're going to be really awesome gains. You're just going to be better and better and better for a long time. So a lot of that is like where you started from. Mm-hmm. And uh, I tend to notice that um, females do super, super well uh, into their very, very later years. Mm-hmm. So I would keep my head up. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, next one. Sam Norcliffe asked... What a uh, would a complete reduction in accessories during a peak phase for powerlifting equal some muscle loss? If you're very advanced, potentially. Depends on how long your peaking phase is. Mm-hmm. If your peaking phase is four weeks, the answer is technically yes, but you get your muscle back in a week of training. Very quickly, yeah. And as I remember, it's not a myonuclear loss, it's mm-hmm. a sarcoplasmic loss mm-hmm. usually, so it's whatever. You just look smaller, but you get it back instantly. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's an eight-week peaking phase, which has mm-hmm. ha- can happen for advanced athletes, then you're actually not, it's not a good idea to remove all of your accessories, especially in that first month. Mm-hmm. What you want to do, and here's the real trick, the rule is you want to reduce your accessory volume significantly, but getting rid of all accessories may not be the answer for you. Mm-hmm. And for some people it is, mm-hmm. but for some people it's not. Uh, here's an interesting example. One of my friends, and who I've helped uh, design programs for for a while, his pecs grew and they grew big, but they just seemed to have a really high turnover rate. So like, if he'd stopped doing flies, they would just get smaller and weaker. It was nuts. Wow. But So we kept his heavy dumbbell flies into the two weeks before his meet, and he would have his best bench press results. Yep. But even if we cranked up the pressing volume, but took out flies, mm-hmm. he would his pecs would visibly get smaller, and then his bench press would decline. Wow. I was like, what the fuck's going on? Wow. So for some people, the accessory work uh, has a huge effect on keeping their hypertrophy or keeping their muscularity in place. And for some other people, it doesn't as much. Mm-hmm. So what I would say is, um, whatever, wherever you are in your powerlifting, however long your peaking phase is, try to reduce accessory volume and you'll probably have great results. Mm-hmm. And the next go-around, 
try to reduce it a bit more and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And you might find that, like, yeah, you know, I, the results weren't that great. You might see visible reductions in muscularity and, and concomitant reductions in strength. And then you're like, okay, fuck that. That was too little. And then you try to, let's say you start at 50% volume reduction for accessories, and then you tried 25%, and it was like, eh, go back, go, go to 60 or 75. Mm -hmm. And you might, again, you might look big, but you're, like, too fatigued. So you're like, okay, 50 was the golden zone. But you might find that 75 is the golden zone, or 25 is the golden zone. So it's something to start off. Everyone needs a reduction, and then sort of go from there. Um, it's interesting. A lot of the answers people want, and we all want them, uh, they're never available in a textbook because it's just, here's the general principles, mm -hmm. now go titrate them to your own, calibrate them to your own needs. And a, and a wise coach can help you interpret what's going on with you, but even a wise coach can't tell you what the answer is. He has to throw you through the gauntlet and oh, figure yeah. it out. Yeah. I wish we had these fucking, like, you know, like, basically genie in a bottle type fucking answers. Sometimes we just don't. Mm -hmm. People say, like, oh, like... What's going to work for me, this or that? And I'm like, man, you're just going to have to try both. I'm like, what does the theory say? I'm like, the theory says 50% of people do better with this, 50 with this. So good luck. Yep. <laughs> yep. No, I definitely feel that. Um, all right, cool. One of my clients, um, Tavi, he has asked a question. He's actually a massive fan of you, so he'd be really oh stoked boy. about okay. this. Um, so how do you calculate your MRV? It's one of his favorite topics to talk to me about all the time. Okay. He wants to hear it from you. How do you calculate your MRV for a particular muscle group uh, when doing compound movements? Was out. Fucking weird words up here, man. I'm not <laughs> used to this shit. <laughs> we don't have magpies that sound like that in the states. I don't even know if we have magpies at all. So, um, for compound movements, mm -hmm. so this is something that uh, James Hoffman and I actually cover in our RP Plus webinars quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to get into a situation. We are counting tons of fractional set MRVs. Like, well, bench is a third triceps yeah. and one for chest. Um, because it complicates the equation to a point beyond your ability to actually utilize it because the noise from other variables is actually greater. Yeah. It's like going and getting a thermometer at like a local store and try, you know, it, it's good to within. 0.5 a degree mm -hmm. Celsius, mm -hmm. and you're trying to use it for a laboratory experiment where you need a 0.1 degree. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Or like your bathroom scale. Mm -hmm. You ever step on your scale and you lean forward and it's like 0.2 and you lean back and it's 0.0. You're like, well, clearly this Come is on. all bullshit, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so what you want to do... I always lean forward. It's just so that I get that extra. Whatever. Yeah. Like what on a mass phase, you yeah. lean forward. Oh, on yeah. a cut, you lean back. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Lying to yourself is an art. <laughs> So basically, for MRV calculation, um, you have your compound movements. You're never going to just completely delete them away. <laughs> You're going to have some kind of compound movements. And then what you do is, uh, if you want to get real technical, you can use the SFR, stimulus to fatigue ratio, on both the stimulus and fatigue side to real honest real world assess what unit of stimulus and fatigue you're getting in that muscle from that exercise I wouldn't fractional lies beyond thirds really beyond half sets um, but I think to thirds and for sure to half sets is useful mm -hmm. so for example someone says you know okay uh, high bar squat do, does they contribute do they contribute to the volume for your glutes yes do they fuck up your glutes like hip thrusts do? No. Mm -hmm. Do they fuck them up like lunges do? No. What about sumo deficit deadlifts? Also no. So those all three that I just listed can be one set unit to your MRV or whatever mm -hmm. for glutes. And high bar squats can be like, like if you do 10 sets of high bar squats and your glutes kind of feel tight and tired, then you count them as two thirds or 0.5. But like if you could do like 10 sets of high bar squats and your quads get fried, but your glutes honestly legitimately barely feel a thing, because you know they're for a fact biomechanically involved and they're a big muscle group and they have to be contributing, maybe you count them as a third, mm -hmm. something like that. If you want to run the numbers like that, fucking do it to your heart's content. My only sort of not warning, but uh, caveat is don't get into the weeds too much because here, remember I said like the, there's going to be other factors that are bigger noise than signal. Um, which other exercises you include in your program? Like if you do, let's say for your glute MRV, 
you've got lunges and hip thrusts one mesocycle, and you've got sumo deadlifts and high bar squats the next. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't matter how closely you calculate the high bar squat contribution, because you took out lunges and uh, hip thrusts, and now you have sumo deficit deads, you're like, I don't know, like, if I just replaced one exercise, I could do this, but because two, you don't even know where the fatigue and fitness is coming no, from. True. So uh, do your best to assess what's really contributing and then go from there. And, and, and this is where the biomechanic stuff on paper can get a little bit divergent from your actual sensation. So some people could say like dips, you count one set of dips mm -hmm. for triceps. Mm -hmm. But like some people, and we actually just had a question about this, I think on RP Plus, uh, some people just dips fuck their chest mm -hmm. up. And they could do like 10 sets of dips and just nothing happens. There's no doms in their triceps. There's barely a pump. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no perception of tension in the tricep. Hardly like, yeah, it's sort of working. That's not really one. You know, and then let's say you do a skull crusher set and it just fucking tortures your triceps. Are you really going to say that that is the same equivalent of stimulus and fatigue as the dips? Yeah. No, no, it's just the answer is just no. So that's where that real world stuff comes in. Uh, and again, I don't know what you're doing with your MRV stuff, or how you're tabulating it. Mm -hmm. um, what you do with this data is a big question. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, okay, now you got all these values, like your chest MRV for this mesocycle and this specific arrangement of exercises mm -hmm. in this specific phase of, of uh, your diet that you're doing. This current specific body comp was 17.5 sets. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Well, you're yeah. never going to repeat that identical mm -hmm. agglomeration of factors ever. Mm -hmm. So sweet, you did it. Um, what I would be more interested in is using stimulus to fatigue ratios uh, every single microcycle to dose training in an auto-regulated fashion. So for example, you do a couple of exercises together in a tricep session and you rate, okay, did I get a good, decent, robust stimulus? Was there some pump, some lactate accumulation, a little bit of soreness or disruption of some kind? Was it enough to get like a good training session? Probably simulative. Was it too much? Like you, you're like, oh, I did great for my first microcycle, and then you're like violent doms for a week in your triceps, and clearly I overdid it, right? <laughs> or you're like triceps, and then just nothing happens. You got no pump, nothing. Which one of those was? It? And if it was that middle of the middle of the roads, the good stuff, you add one or two sets to it next week and hope that it's still middle of the road good. And if it's not enough, you add maybe two or three sets next week. Yeah. And if it's too much, you don't add sets next week. Just wait. That kind of thing eventually leads you to your MRV. And then you count all the sets when you fucking shit the bed and hit your MRV, and you go, okay, it's that many sets of all the shit that caused this. Yeah. That's the really important thing. And that MRV number that you get at the end of it, it's the most ballpark fucking shit in the world. Mm -hmm. Because you're gonna be altering so many variables. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say your MRV is 20. Hold on, I just have to stop you because you just he just gave away everything I do for coaching, so can you not, you're gonna put me out of a job. Sorry, my bad, <laughs> oh boy. Literally everything that I do, I just listen to the letter, I'm like, oh, Well, man. there's a very good demand so, for your services. I don't, need to, do don't, do I don't need to do it at all anymore. <laughs> That's right, so, <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> what you end up getting is this rough ballpark number, and that ballpark number is something to know that when it's coming, you're going to be getting ready to shit the bed. So, for example, someone can say, okay, like, um, I've just hit, let's say we know our chest MRV usually is around 20 cents per week. Let's say if they're hitting, last week they did 18 cents. Mm -hmm. And they come to you, Dalton, the coach, and they say, hey, it would be really convenient if I extended my mesocycle by three more weeks. Mm -hmm. Do you think I can handle it? You're like, no, probably not. You'll probably hit your MRV next week. Yep. It's just only something like, yeah, maybe you so get to 22, but you're not going to 25. Yeah. Fuck out of yeah, here. Right. Um, so and how effective is that after you hit that? And what are you doing from there to make it recoverable so that you can then run knows? that again? Like, it, exactly, exactly. Because if you're doing it once, what are we doing? We're not, we're not adding anything here. Uh, totally. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's one of those things like, be careful about over-specifying MRV because it's really rough. What you want to be really keen on doing is that auto-regulation, microcycle to microcycle sure. to microcycle. Am I doing enough? Am I doing too much? Am I not doing enough? And how am I titrating my volume still coming? Yeah, that's, no, that's really good. Love it. Awesome. Um, actually, this one is check. How long have we been going for? Yeah, sweet. We've got ages. Um, alrighty, so uh, Christian has asked, powerlifting singles during a mesocycle of hypertrophy yeah, is it too much uh, because of volume if you would assume the RP is around a 7 or a 9 powerlifting singles well, so some singles during it's muscle not too much yep. uh, it's not a very high fatigue contribution but uh, if you think about the, however many sets you could have done that would have gotten you more jacked you didn't because you were busy doing 
singles. Mm -hmm. And the next question you have to ask yourself is, why are you doing singles? <laughs> yeah. I've yet to receive a very good answer to that. Yeah. If it's for the soul, you just love doing it, sweet. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not costing you directly, it's an opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. Like you could have done just more right. work mm -hmm. of a beneficial fact or beneficial variety. Um, does it enhance injury risk needlessly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the stronger you get, the less apt you are to do stuff like that. Um, I haven't done single in God knows how long because I can't risk it. Mm -hmm. When you start squatting over 250K, every single is like, gee, am I really interested in doing this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's not that it's bad by itself, but yeah, it starts to be, uh, you know, when you are um, perplexed at how you would justify your practice of it mm -hmm. to someone that knows their shit, mm -hmm. it's probably time to stop doing this. <laughs> like, like, how the hell do I explain this? Why are you doing it? Yeah, 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 it's definitely, I think it's a, a, an opportunity to take away from the things that are really adding to what your goal focus is at that sure. time. Sure, so. totally. Yep, awesome. Alrighty, um, so last one of the pre-prepared questions. Katie Hahn, she is a 72, 72 kilo female uh, Olympic lifter. Uh, she has one quad that's bigger than the other. How would you correct this? What would you do to correct this? Well, this is a really good question. So you may have a limb length asymmetry or uh, an asymmetry in a variety of other body factors, and the different size quad may be your body's way of accommodating for it. As a sure as hell, body's not going to grow an extra bone length. <laughs> um, and you might have a nervous system situation where your nervous system is just not as active in one quad as another, for lack of a better term. I get more specific, but let's bear that. So then one quad, that quad hypertrophies more to make up for the fact that it's just not contributing as much work as it should be, or as much force. So seeking to balance that from an aesthetic perspective may be unbalancing the reason that it's a different size. And then all of a sudden, you're throwing yourself off balance by visually balancing something that is already balanced for a reason. And if you're an Olympic lifter, I would say as long as your bar path is normal and you're not weirdly tilting to the side of the quad that's small like because it's weak, then there is no need to fix it. Mm -hmm. also, everyone's quads are a different size. Um, I'm not sure how different yours are and if a third party can actually tell you. This is interesting. Uh, you, why don't you just walk around, if, unless you bitch to everyone at the gym about this, and they're like, yes, we know which one is smaller. Ask people who just don't know you that well hey, like, they look at my legs, which one is smaller? Like, I've done that with people that my arms, because I, my arms are two different sizes also, like everyone's, and pecs and everything, and I'm like, hey, which one's bigger? And, like, if a non-reliable number of people can't differentiate, like, you're good, yeah. man. Yeah. Nobody can even tell. Uh, if you really just, from an aesthetic perspective, need them the same, so if this was a, it's interesting, this is an Olympic weightlifter, mm. because if it was a bodybuilder, I'd say, okay, yeah, maybe you need something to fix. The, the real question is then... Well, the real answer becomes, here's how you fix it. You drop your combo training, your both leg training, to its either maintenance volume or minimum effective volume. Mm -hmm. And through single leg work, you cycle from your minimum effective volume to your maximum recovery volume, normal training, for just the weaker quad until it's as big or bigger than the other quad, and then you slowly ease back into more bilateral training. Because a lot of people just think you just add single leg work but if you add work to an already optimized training program, you're by definition making it worse for that bad quad. Yeah. Um, so, and, yeah. then, and then some people get into the thing, well, so does that mean my good quad I have to like back off on? Like, well, yeah. And they're like, but can't I grow that too at the same time? Like, how the fuck are you gonna grow your good quad and catch up your bad quad? Magic? And if yeah. that was the case, why don't you just do that thing to both quads? You just get fucking enormous. Yeah. So there's gonna be some trade-offs there. Yeah. And so, uh, and again, then, then the, the answer there is make sure they're worth it. Because if your biomechanics are good on your lifts, if the quads are big or small or whatever, but they make symmetrical lifting, you don't have any injury, like sort of like my knee hurts because my quad is weak or it throws off my hips. Mm -hmm. If none of that is happening, fucking uh, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, sweet. I'm just going to browse this, see if I can see any uh, questions and stuff. Was it mostly just people with like... Joining and disjoining and stuff like that, but um, because I accidentally closed it on this one, and then reopened it because some of the questions have dropped out just because it, I'll just check it on here Sure, real quick. totally. Hopefully I don't crash it. Oh boy. I'll let you know on here.
joining. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here's a good one. Um, so, uh, Sean, uh, like one of our old clients, um, has asked you, after your last cut, what was the three most important lifestyle and training things that you learned from your cut? What really came to light this time? Well, I can't guarantee that what I'm about to share are the three most important ones because they're off the top of my head and I haven't sure. given this a detailed amount of thought. Uh, lifestyle and training, mm -hmm. respectively. Um, with training, I started to, I started doing a higher frequency approach, mm -hmm. three time a week per large muscle group, because I usually do two, mm -hmm. and I found out that, um, that really does work pretty well for some muscle groups and maybe not as well for others, mm -hmm. because they're always very difficult for my hamstrings to hit their minimum effective per session volume and still recover on time for three times a week, because they just fucking recover so slow. Yeah. And uh, surprisingly for my pecs and my triceps and for sure for my back, uh, my pulling musculature, there uh, has been awesome recovery. Fucking dog. He's uh, a, a, a guard poodle. <laughs> it's really scary. Um, so I learned that uh, in training. Uh, something I sort of relearned was that if you stay nice and far from failure, two or three reps away from fail, early in mesocycles, on cutting especially, you just continue to add intensity and volume and everything goes super well. But if you come too close to failure early, you accumulate so much fatigue that you just end up having to recycle everything because you just hit the wall. And this is something I rediscover all the time, but stupidly, you know, you start a, mi a microcycle and you're like, ah, I'm gonna get close. Uh, just some, somewhere from magic, things yeah. are just gonna happen. Um, what's another training thing? Uh, Skull crushers are great. I don't know. I had like a really good experience. Smith, uh, what is it called? Um, I had a really good time hack squatting. Mm -hmm. uh, I used hack squats a lot on my fat loss phase. And um, I did uh, hack squats first and then high bar squats after. Mm -hmm. And that meant that uh, my axial loading wasn't as great and my quad specific work was a little better and it worked out super well. Yeah. Um, also, um, I just sort of refell in love with paused squatting. I think it's just great, especially in a fat loss phase when you don't want to push anything that might get you hurt. Mm -hmm. Paused squatting was super, super beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, and then lifestyle stuff. Gee, okay, so first of all, eating lower palatability foods is an incredibly effective way of cutting. I barely got hungry the entire time. This is the leanest I ever got. Mm -hmm. um, another one was just um, I had to look at my calendar a lot to figure out what day it was because I was a groundhog day everything mm -hmm. almost all the days were identical and I remember I had this one experience where I was on the treadmill doing cardio and I had so much momentum from just living life identically every day I was getting all my work done I was getting all my meals in, I was getting all my training in, I was getting all my cardio in because of the system that mm -hmm. I set up of I knew exactly what happened every day um, that I was like, I'm doing cardio and I was like, I could die like this forever. Like I'd have like, can you imagine having that thought? Like this is like 14 weeks of your fat loss diet, <laughs> which is like pretty rare thought to yeah. have. And I was like, wow, what a powerful method I, mm -hmm. I have here. Um, and I remember like, I had to do a couple of business trips during the middle to tail end of the cut, and it was so much harder. Mm -hmm. Like, I went to Finland to do a talk, and um, I had to, like, you know, eat protein bars, and the Finnish scene for groceries and protein stuff and gyms is excellent. It's as good as anywhere. Mm -hmm. Even still, the fact that I had to pick new food choices, go shopping for them, blah, 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 the days, the schedule was different, it was psychologically so much more difficult, so much more fatiguing. Yeah. But when I was back at home, it was like I couldn't fail. Mm -hmm. And and also there was like no cheat food or junk food in my house, so like I just would eat the same things, and yeah. it would just never come up. Yeah. Whereas like you know when you have certain a lot of macros and you walk into a grocery store in a foreign country, you're like man, time to mix and match, yeah. and you kind of get carried away with eating tastier things. So having a system is super awesome. Part of that system was eating a lot of really similar foods all the time. I would vary the specific foods, like I would have a fruit with a meal. That fruit was different time to time to time. Mm -hmm. 
could have a protein source, but that protein source was like one of three things. Um, ate a lot of um, high fiber bread mm -hmm. because it filled me mm -hmm. up a lot. But it was like really similar meal times, really similar meals, and that just uh, reduces the cognitive load. It reduces the temptation to get too creative and get the palatability going. Mm -hmm. um, and it basically, because cutting is so hard already, if you, have, you just live your life like a machine in the sense, not like grind willpower, but in the sense of like, what's next? Oh yeah, my calendar tells me exactly what I do next. Yeah. And it's, it's something I've expected. Then it becomes just a matter of going through the motions. Yeah. And then it actually like makes time go by faster. Because you know, when you're cutting, you don't exactly want to like, people say like, enjoy every moment of life. Like, fuck that, I don't want to enjoy my cutting moments. I want to fucking over it. And it was like, weeks would go by. And I was like, whoa, I'm so much leaner. And like, oh my God, it's already February. Like shit like that would happen. Yeah. Whereas I think if you like, uh, you know, try to get a little too clever with your shit and vary your schedule and stuff. Shut up, bird. Is hunting legal here? Uh, yes. We'll say yes. In the summer, so just shoot <laughs> yeah. birds randomly. Um, so if you try to get a little too creative, I think sometimes that can enhance the cognitive load and the burden. And during a maintenance phase, it's super fun. During muscle gain, it's really fun. During especially fat loss, there's something to getting into that repetitive motion, that repetitive zone. And if you have like competitors in whatever sport you do, Whichever competitors relish being in that Groundhog Day, does that mean anything to you guys here in Australia? Yeah, 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 we get the concept. Oh, yeah, sweet. Because, um, you know, fucking, I, I'm from Russia, I had no idea what the fuck Groundhog was. Or Groundhog Day, I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> um, so, in Russia, we shoot the Groundhog. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, if a competitor of yours really relishes uh, that boring similarity and sameness, you got a dangerous fuck on your hands. Yeah. You better not learn that that person likes that. Like, oh, he loves the grind. You're like, shit, mm. that's not good. Mm. <laughs> right? But if someone's like, oh, he like really can't do like these long preps, you're like, fuck that cat. Like, I'm going to beat this guy. Whatever sport it is. Mm. Like, <laughs> I remember we had a guy in uh, a wrestling team who uh, would set up the dummy and just do takedowns on the dummy for like reps and reps and reps and hit, and hit the wall. It was a padded wall. It was still a fucking wall. I was like, damn, Itai is a dangerous fuck. He didn't have like really good genetics or anything. He was just... just like he would just persevere yeah. and he could do the boring shit mm -hmm. and then what did he do in tournaments he just took everyone down and you were like that's not a surprise so if you can make peace with this sort of stillness and the repetitiveness and the boringness of prep mm -hmm. um, and even thrive in it you're gonna sooner or later your body's just gonna change and change and change and yeah. voila you're gonna be amazing yeah that's right I think that's a really cool insight We, uh, it's definitely something I've experienced since working with Flex with all the athletes and stuff that we work with we have a heap of general population people so we do um, we are massive proponents for flexible dieting. We are massive proponents for nutritional education for people because there's such misinformation. However, our athletes we seem to find, and the ones that come through and just smash it, uh, especially uh, a lot of these types, these types that can just tolerate doing the repetitive things over and over and over so to the point that they achieve what they set out to achieve. And those that struggle with that may not necessarily get as lean, but we just it's, it's just a lot more, um, well, sorry, they definitely still get as lean. Sure. It's just that psychologically taxing where it just it feels a lot harder totally. from what they go through. So that definitely makes sense. I think even for gen pop clients, you want them to first establish reliable habits mm -hmm. of maybe not even habits, like you just tell them, here's good foods to rely on, eat these and then hit these macros. Mm -hmm. After a while when they've shown that they can do this, you allow them to, you educate them in nutrition enough to where they sort of broaden their stream to be more IFYM, right? And then they can like sort of pick and choose, pick and choose, pick and choose. And then there's a contraction back to, to a smaller amount of now that instead of the prescribed foods you recommended to them that they should rely on, they've opened up their palate and then IFYM their way back to their own recommended foods. And so, for example, when they travel on business or something, they, they go into a servo, they grab the things they know they need, and they leave. Because if you're pure IFYM, especially at the beginning of that journey, yeah. fuck, man, the yeah, store is a confusing fucking place. Oh, yeah. And it just, it's, again, a huge, huge cognitive load. So I think the best way to use flexible dieting is at first give people the tools to diet simply. You know, you don't just like, hey, like housewife day one, you're like, here's your fucking macros, go to the store and count shit. Like, yeah. what? They're not gonna do that. They'd be like, here's some three lean meats, three veggies, three grains you can rely on, and then just eat this much. And after a couple of weeks, they're like, this is boring, but I'm really good at it. You're like, ah, it's boring, okay, here's how to count macros. It's like, wow, this is amazing. Then you let them sort of explore that world, and then at some point, they're like, macro counting is great, but fuck, like, 
I'm like a, I need to like calculate every meal all the time. You're like, huh, why don't you find the food you typically eat, the good healthy stuff, and mostly rely on that because you already know the macros of them. It's easy to count. And then they come back and then there's that sort of really good uh, position of balance where they have this core reliance on these basic foods they they know macros for and then they halfway on the rest. Mm -hmm. There's a very big difference between flexible dieting with a core of good, solid, healthy foods Mm -hmm. versus pure flexible which is just kind of like it's so flexible it's like a blob yeah it's like you go and it squishes out the other way and then it's just not very useful because like yeah you could do it but it just requires a shitload of of cognitive load all the time yeah yeah i don't find many people that can survive doing it continually flexibly every day changing up things like it just becomes too 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 many choices yeah totally when to uh, like to what end but um no that's cool i think um i think we're really lucky with flex i've worked for myself and a couple of other companies and uh, been exposed to a lot of different coaches and how we educate people is very similar to what you just described there we just we have a whole learning package that goes alongside the nutritional coaching that they get we do it um, step by step we teach them uh, a range of skills and applicable skills and uh, it's just it just we just seem to get awesome people that come out of it the other end overcoming so much um, of their misinformation but then being able to apply it and we don't see many return clients come back Really people cool. are really lucky to have you guys. I tell you what, you guys are doing something that most people don't do. Most coaches and trainers I'm familiar with don't do shit like that. Uh, back when I was a personal trainer in New York City about a decade ago, like a lot of clients you uh, get are, you're like, all right, you ever dieted before? They're like, uh-huh. I'm like, uh, uh, when did you, you first diet? When did you last diet? They're like, I've been dieting in some way or another with a couple of trainers for 20 years. And I'm like, oh, sweet. So what do you know? And they're like, I don't know shit. Like, what the fuck have you been doing for 20 years? Like, they've just been running these, like, Microsoft, like, Word, mm-hmm. one-page diets. Mm-hmm. Like, eat this, yeah. that, then eat this. Their whole lives. Yeah. They didn't learn a fucking thing, mostly because there was nothing to learn. Yeah. It was like, oh, what's your prescription? I'm like, I don't have a prescription. I have a system. Mm-hmm. Do you want to learn the system? And a lot of people are, like, at first they're apprehensive, but then they learn the system. It was great mm-hmm. from folks like you. Some people, you ever notice that some people just don't even want to learn the system? Oh, yeah. They're just so, maybe not lazy, maybe lazy, just, I don't know what the term is. Yeah, well, they just don't uh, want to know. Yeah. They just don't want to know, they're like, just tell me what to eat. Mm-hmm. It's like, here's the problem, mm-hmm. fuck stick. You're not serious about that statement that came out of your mouth. Mm-hmm. Because that statement relies on you actually doing what I say. Mm-hmm. So if I tell you what to eat, which I easily could, mm-hmm. right? if someone was like, hey, just tell me exactly what to eat to get in shape, you'd be like, yeah, here you go, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? No variety, like just perfect macros, that's it. The problem is they're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. Like you know they're going to burn out, mm-hmm. and they don't know that. Yeah. They fucking should because they burn out every other fucking diet of their life. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when you say, look, we can do this, but I don't recommend it. And some people just don't know. Some people just don't have the uh, foresight to yeah. be like, oh, this is an investment in my health and education. Mm-hmm. They're just like, just give me the diet. It gets me in shape for Thailand. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, no, we are we are very lucky. I think we even with that though, even with how we have our systems and stuff, we still get people who come to us that sure. are just like that. So we work within the means of whatever they come to us and where we can uh, and meet them at. But uh, our big focus really is on nutritional education. Like that's what we do first, as opposed to just because we see it, we get everyone <laughs> from coaches all over Australia. We see their diets and training programs and stuff like that from other people, and it's. Sometimes you're just like, okay, no, like I understand why you're still like this. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like that video, make sure that you click like below and subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. Make sure you can also check down in the description box below for what's going on over at Facebook and Instagram. And you can check out all the other cool things that we've got going on there. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you in the next video, guys.